So thank you very much for inviting me and um, to talk about this topic. And in particular, I just want to commend also what you're doing about documenting the underserved, because when I think about financial inclusion and the work that I have done for over 20 years, it really is serving the underserved and making sure that they become served, they become recognized. So thank you very much for all the work that you have done so far. And um, yes, what I want to talk about, because after you talk, after Anolu Akomo has spoken for over one hour on financial inclusion, you start to wonder that what else is there to say? But uh, thankfully, I think I also have the grace of being a woman. And when you talk about financial exclusion, women tend to be more financially excluded than men in Nigeria. But I want to start first by talking about who are those that are financially underserved, you know? And the definition of financial inclusion, typically people think that financial inclusion is having a bank account, that those who have a bank account are financially included. But I, I, I beg to differ. For me, those who are financially included must meet this following criteria. And the Center for Financial Inclusion, which is a part of Axion, um, defines financial inclusion as a state in which all people who can use financial services have access to a full suite of quality financial services provided at affordable prices in a convenient manner with respect and dignity. So when you define financial inclusion like that, I may even argue that majority of Nigerians, not just the 50% who don't have a bank account, majority of Nigerians are financially excluded. Let me tell you why I say so, because when you talk about financial services, you are talking about a range of products from savings to being able to access loans, to insurance, to payments and remittances. In Nigeria, what most people are able to do is have a bank account and do payments and remittance. Access to credit is still very low. Less than 5% of Nigerians have access to a loan when they need it. So eventually they may get it, but when you need it, the um, FinTech has um, increased that access now, but typically even that access that FinTech has increased is not the required. So for instance, how many Nigerians have access to credit to get a mortgage? How many Nigerians, less than 1% have insurance and insurance provides financial stability. So depending on how you measure financial inclusion, if you measure it that who has a bank account, you will say it's 50%. But if you are measuring it by what truly is financial inclusion, that is when I want a savings account, I have it. When I want credit, I have it. When I need insurance, remittance and so on. And I would beg to argue that I would, almost 90% of Nigerians don't have that. So the financially underserved are those who don't have access to financial services. Those who cannot afford financial services. People complain about bank charges, how much it takes to open an account, even just traveling to the bank. It is not convenient. Where it is not convenient for you to have access to your bank account or services. And it is served in a disrespectful and non-defined manner. And one of the interesting things that happened recently is that issue of the recent Nigerian redesign and restriction of access to cash. What it did was to enable all of us have a taste of what it means to be financially excluded because they denied us access to our savings accounts, to our money, to payments, to remitt remittances. Well, still came because of the foreign exchange, but we could feel it. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to share, but I had a video, and I'm sure a lot of you had seen those videos of people in the bank, even stripping naked just to get money out of their account, complain their children haven't been able to go to school, they can't pay their hospital bills, they can't buy food on the streets. A lot of the people that we consider low income and underserved who are selling on the streets could not sell. I'm sure you saw the videos of um, food stuff perishing because people could not buy. It almost like they put everyone in a state of being financially excluded. And we know the suffering and the pain that we continue to have 
Now imagine that 50% of Nigerians have been living like this for a long time. Because since I have been in the field of financial inclusion, financial inclusion has not gone beyond that 50%. In fact, that 50% is an improvement from when I started in the journey for financial inclusion. So you see the protests we've had, people burning down banks and so on for maybe one week of being financially excluded. Now imagine what it's like for those who live like that day in, day out. So why does financial inclusion matter? I hope that that experience that we all had, and I know some of us are still experiencing it, but that that experience tells us why financial inclusion is important. Financial inclusion matters because it helps people to reduce poverty. In Nigeria, um, the last speaker spoke about the numbers, more than almost 70% is what I would say, live in poverty. That is less than one, um, one, one dollar 90 cents a day. So if you don't have access to financial inclusion, it ensures that you continue to be in poverty. How? I want to give an example. And one of the things is in Nigeria, how do we create wealth? I feel that in Nigeria as a whole, government policies or our leaders don't know how to create what I call equitable wealth. Some people think that to create wealth for those who live um, who are low income or at the bottom of the pyramid is to take from the top. No, equitable wealth is one where you're creating wealth across the pyramid from top to bottom depending on the capital that you invest. So what does financial inclusion do? It enables people have the tools to take advantage of opportunities. So if I give an example, you create the lucky axis and you start to sell land, maybe to the middle class and to the rich. A poor woman, how does she benefit from that wealth that is being created in that area? If she had access to capital, something as low as 50,000 Naira, she can start by selling food to the builders. As she starts selling and people are buying, her 50,000 grows to 100 to 150. And before you know it, maybe far, further down Lake Ishitu, she can buy land. And before you, and that land, can, she can then use it to um, invest, build her house and so on as her business grows. But if she did have access to that initial credit, you will see that, all the wealth that will be created along that building axis, she has no chance of gaining or being um, benefiting from that wealth. Another example I normally give is a woman who lives in poverty uses a scissors, scissors and needle to create a skirt that she can sell. Now, when you give her credit, she can buy a sewing machine. So instead of doing just one skirt a week with her needle and what have you, she's now making 10. So that's how you create wealth by being financially included, by having access to those credits. So it reduces poverty because it enables people to save, borrow, and invest their money so that they can have access to financial stability and resilience, especially when you talk about insurance. When we say lending to people in um, Lagos markets, a lot of Lagos, Lagos Island, we bundled our loans with insurance and when there was a fire in the, in the um, Lagos and in the Balogo area at that time, they were the very first to be able to recoup and restart their businesses because they had access to insurance. Insurance paid for the stock as well as paid off their loans. So a lot of them started coming to take the loan so that they could even have access to that insurance. So people need those services. One of the key things that continues to make sure that they are excluded is a lack of awareness, but I will get there. Financial inclusion also helps to promote economic growth. The more people who are wealthy, the more you will see that even the economy as a whole starts to generate wealth. When you have half our people financially excluded, it is no surprise that 70% are in poverty and are not able to come out of that poverty. So how do you then have economic growth? And economic growth occurs where if you have a business and majority of the people can afford to buy your services, you will see your business will grow. But if only a few, 1% of the Nigerian economy can buy, even your business will be constrained even as a middle class. So we need more people who are able 
to grow and to actually have access to wealth so that the economy can actually grow. It, the other one about why financial inclusion is, um, why financial inclusion matters is it increases financial stability. It helps people to cope, cope with financial. So I just gave you the example of the fire in Balogo. Insurance, for instance, is very important and is an important part of financial inclusion. Then it promotes gender equality. This is always very dear to me. You will find that in Nigeria, more women are financially excluded than men. I think Efina estimates that there's a 14% gender um, gap between male and women that are financially excluded. But if you encourage more women to have access to financial services, they will be able to empower their families, send their children, more children will be in school than out of school. The next generation will have better economic status. So it also helps with gender um, equality. Then it enhances social inclusion. I've had some of our customers that we've given loans to during our customer forum come and say to me that we give them dignity. Because before when they were poor and had no money, nobody even ask them um, their opinion. They make decisions for them and they too felt they had no, they could not talk, they had no voice. But having access to capital, to credits, to growing your business gives you a voice, makes you feel financially included. It helps marginalized groups like the poor, the elderly, people living with disability feel included and it promotes their overall well being. So financial inclusion matters, and I'm sure that we all know that it matters. Why? That is why we are talking about it today. So what are the factors that lead to an individual becoming financially excluded? Why do we have such? And truly, I really would have wanted to share this picture. Yes, I think I can share now with you. That shows, um, that shows what policies we do to continue to put people in poverty. This is crushing the livelihoods of the underserved. Here, what you can see is those who are driving Keke Mapep, and this happened in Abuja. First of all, they destroyed over a thousand um, bicycles, motorbikes, and then another one was the 300, and you can see them, they're looking as their wealth is being destroyed. Their wealth is being destroyed under them. Are we saying that government could not come up with a better policy than destroying this means of livelihood for those who are underserved? When we think about amnesty, we say, bring a gun and I will give you X in return so that you don't shoot. If we don't want motorbikes, because of the danger, they are killing themselves, they use it for crime and what have you. Tell them to bring the bike and we'll give you a keke mapep. Tell them to bring the bike and we'll give you a taxi that you will repay over the duration. Why just destroy it and put people out there in poverty? So those are some of the kinds of policies that you see that makes people continue to be financially underserved. What are the factors that lead to that, especially in Nigeria? Poverty rates are so high. When we ask people, why don't you have a bank account? They said, in the first place, do I have money that I'm going to put there? So what, the more people live in poverty, the less likelihood they are, are to go for financial services, whether it's even for digital identification or for any form. One of the studies we did was to say, when we are looking at all these forms of digital identification or identification in any form, the only one that is free is the voter's card. And we all know what it took to even get your voter's card. And I can argue that it's not even free because we have to keep going back, taking transport to go and queue and all of that to get your card. So some people can't even afford to get that identification. When you look at women, a woman is born, say Mary John, gets married, first of all, gets the ID card for Mary John, then gets married, becomes Mary Thomas. She has to go and swear, publish in the newspaper her name before she can even get that identification and open a bank account. 
That's part of why you will see that more women are financially excluded than men. So the rules and regulations actually, it's almost as if they are put out there to actually limit those who should become financially included and um, reduce poverty. Of course, some of the issues that affect those who do not have um, access to financial services is limited financial literacy. That's already been said. Then in some areas, there are no banks, there are no financial institutions. The infrastructure that is required to even provide digital services like OPA and all of that is just not there across Nigeria because government is not investing in those areas and it doesn't make financial sense for those banks in the private sector to actually serve in those areas. So those are the, some of the things. You can't put an ATM there, you can't put POS, you can't do mobile banking in those um, areas. Then there's discrimination and exclusion. And I was looking through some of the um, documentaries that you're showing that I saw that the exclusion from financial services due to status, widows, for instance, I saw the one about the widow and don't die so that you don't leave me alone. Widows are discriminated against. Those who are single, women generally, or you are married. Discrimination are too based on race, ethnicity, even religion, because some religions say, oh, I don't take interest, I don't do that. And therefore the design of the product is not done in a way that people with those, their religious beliefs or cultural beliefs are not served. Yeah. So those are some of the reasons why they are not um, included. Then people themselves lack trust of banks. I, and I, I mean, I witness that all the time. When you talk about microfinance, for instance, oh my God, is a double discrimination. Is what we call like the black woman who is both black and is feminine. And so therefore she has double discrimination. That's it for microfinance. People don't trust those services. In fact, some would rather rely on money lenders, pawn brokers, friends and families, keeping the money under their pillows rather than go and put money in the bank. Oh, if I put it in the bank, the bank charges, they will take all my money. Somebody else will take, as well as you are hearing all the stories of fraud and two point something billion is lost today, tomorrow. Ah, people would rather put their money under their, their pillows. Then lack of documentation. I've talked about the one for the women. To me, I think it's an, almost as if it's an intentional discrimination against women to have to go through that process of changing the name. Why is the marriage certificate not enough to prove that you have gotten married and you want to change your name to your husband's name, if you so desire? But no, the banks will say you must go publish it in the newspaper and so on and so forth for some number of days, go and swear in the court. Is the marriage certificate not a document that is legally recognized? Why are we creating additional barriers for you to be able to open a bank account? And the CBN has actually done a lot of work in trying to reduce the level of documentation by having three tier, what we call the three tier KYC. So tier one, you only need a passport photograph, your name and an address. Or sometimes those financial services, apart from the fintechs that are more innovative, keep asking for those documents. So it then disenfranchises a lot of people and they are not able to open a bank account or have access to credit. Some of the reasons why we don't have access to credit, banks or lenders will continue to ask for collateral property as collateral. And when you then take the property, you do not have a C of O, which is the legally recognized title to the document. Only 1% of Nigerians have proper title to their property. So where you are insisting that you must bring a C of O before you can get a loan, how then would you be able to borrow? That means you're only able to give funding to only 1% of the Nigerian population. So those are some of the things that make it that people do not have access. And when I'm talking about access, it's access across all the financial services, not just a bank account, but credit and so on and so forth. So how, how do we then solve a lot of these problems that occur? So one of the reasons why I went into detail about what creates and people that are financially understaffed is for us to be able to come up with solutions. My very first solution 
generally is that government regulation needs to be done in a manner that creates equitable wealth. I will give another example. Take the Eco Atlantic. It was Babbage, open to every person in Nigeria to be able to go and have leisure or you know, watch the beach. Suddenly, you want to sell the land, you sand fill it and sell it to a few rich Nigerians. I'm not saying that there was corruption or it wasn't done. But to me, if you want to create wealth, what I would do if I wanted to reclaim garbage would be to sell it to builders, mortgage institutions. So private corporations then build those properties. They build flats, they build high rises. Then you can sell each house. And then mortgage banks give loans for each flat. So you see, you are creating an economy. You are creating that the middle class can also buy. The low income people um, benefit because they are also involved in the building. As I said, people can sell food, sell all these things, create uh, and become workers there. Then as a middle class also borrows money from mortgage institutions, government can put in place guarantees so that more people have access. And then as you buy those that flats out of this 1 billion or maybe 10, 100 million um, dollar property, and you're just buying one flat there, you can then use it as collateral for um, income for your business to grow it and so on and so forth. So you will see that that's what I call equitable wealth. So yes, they've sold off that prime land to a few people. Those few people are even finding it hard to raise the capital to build because um, funding will not go where they feel that it is only a niche that can afford it. So what has happened? Capital of that place is locked in a few hands and generally people are not benefiting from such a place that could have created wealth. So a lot of times the policies that we do do not enable wealth to be created. And when once wealth is not created, financial inclusion too is affected because people are not going to open a bank account. To, what are they taking credit for when the economy is on, in decline, when people are living in poverty and all of those kind of things. So it is like a tax 22. So lastly, I just wanted to point out some areas that I felt that IREF in particular can support the drive for financial inclusion. I know when Olu said that, I said, oh, that's the same thing I did. So number one, I would say, is that we can create financial education campaigns. Your documentaries, some of them, I actually feel border on you know, the underserved and looking at how money has affected their lives. So we can do that, but also the positive aspects too, to showcase that those who had access to financial services, how were their lives transformed? So we are talking about, um, I can't, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce it, but when, when you talk about the Allah Barrow, I think that's what you were saying, and how they were able to then access capital and have a business today to showcase those kinds of stories. So campaigns to educate people on financial management, particularly even in the area of insurance. One of the reasons why I feel people don't buy insurance is because they don't understand the benefits. Then even for borrowing, what are the benefits of and risk of borrowing? What are the type of borrowings that align to the cultural um, and um, religious beliefs that we have. Those are some of the things that can also be showcased. Then create content that promotes entrepreneurship. I see that too. There was one of the um, articles there. I mean, the documentaries that also talked, showcase successful entrepreneurs and what they did. And those kinds of things lend themselves to motivate people to want to also um, inspire and motivate them so that they can actually become financially independent. Then collaborate with financial service providers. I know this is one area that I feel is very, typically found to be very tough. You're putting a creative person with this banker who is very strict, logical, and so on. But there are areas for collaboration, even in the products and the mobile apps that we use. People talk about the, the fact that people are illiterate. That's why they are not able to use it. Yes, you can use animation even right there on your phones. We don't need to use numbers. We don't need, you can use pictures and so on and so forth that can make those products more relevant to the people who would use them. And I think that the creative industry 
has better sense of being able to improve customer experience and the services that financial providers provide to them. Then develop financial literacy program for children. That is so important from childhood, people are learning about savings, opening accounts. And some of my own childhood memories include playing Monopoly, playing payday and all those, those kind of things that when you grow up, you start to see what they're trying to teach you. So I do feel that having those kind of documentaries that can be shown in school, that tell stories, interactive games that, they, that enable people to learn about finance in a fun and engaging way is very important. And then of course, using art to promote financial inclusion, morale, sculptures, and so on, that tell people about financial management and the benefits of financial services. And I was just going through the bouquet of um, documentaries that are showcased, and I just listed a few here, and I could just see a lot of them. What some of them, the main reason why they were in those positions is access to finance, access to um, wealth. Being financially excluded would make some of these stories, you know, as painful as they are, if they had access, it would have created better stories. I like particularly her story, Educate a Woman, Educate a Nation. The Ode to Heroines, I am heroine, and then the Gift Stepper and so on and so forth. All of them have a story about financial inclusion. And I hope that um, the few words that I've shared today would help you understand the importance of financial inclusion and why as a nation we need it and we need to create equitable wealth. Thank you very much.